Good morning, members, officers, and any members of the public who are viewing the live stream of this meeting. Welcome to this meeting of the Audit and Corporate Governance Committee. My name is Councillor Tony Mason, and I am the chair of the committee. Please can those present in the council chamber note that everything on your desk, including your laptop screen, is likely to be broadcast at some point. The camera follows the microphone being switched on, so councillors and officers are advised to wait a couple of seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up. Please can those participating in the meeting via the live stream indicate that you wish to speak via the chat column. Please do not use the chat column for any other purpose. Make sure that your device is fully charged and that you switch your microphone off unless you are invited to do otherwise. Please ensure that you have switched off or silenced any other devices you have so that they do not interrupt proceedings. And please use a headset when speaking and hold the microphone close to your mouth. <laughs> when you are invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. When you finish addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone immediately. Please speak slowly, clearly and please do not talk over or interrupt anyone. Apologies. Item one on our agenda today is apologies for absence. Patrick, are there any apologies for absence today, please? Uh, Chair, I have not had any apologies reported to me. Councillor Howell. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams will be late, uh, about three quarters of an hour. So if you crack on, you might be able to finish in that time. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Agenda item two, declarations of interest. Do any members have interests to declare in relation to any item of business on this agenda? If any interest subsequently becomes apparent later in the meeting, please would you raise it at that point? No declarations. Minutes. Are members happy to approve the minutes of the meeting of the committee held on 4th of February 2022 as a correct record? If so, I move the approval of the minutes. Okay. So, for members of the committee, um, agenda item four and five are being deferred from today's agenda uh, as they, they were not published with five clear days from the, the issuing of the agenda. We will rearrange a meeting at the earliest opportunity, um, but we need to vote individually to defer these items. So, on agenda item four, the completion of the 2018-19 accounts, can I have the committee's acceptance to defer to, the, to an, another meeting? And on agenda item five, the 2018-19 audit results report from external audit. Agreed? Okay, so agenda items four and five have been agreed to be deferred to an, 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 another meeting. Excuse me, Chairman, sorry to interrupt you. Can we have an approximation of when that meeting will be held? We are awaiting the um, release of the report from EY. Once we receive the report from EY, then it, it, it should be, we hope, today. Sorry, through you, Chair, just to add that I've heard from the partner of EY this morning who is planning to sign the accounts this morning, and she's given me some availability for next week for dates. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just asking, so is next week allowed because we're going to this period of thing? Right? Through you, Chair, we're already in pre-election period and business as usual is permitted, um, and so I see no problem with continuing next week. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Chairman, if the meeting is going to be held quickly, because obviously we all have other things and we know normally very months in advance of when uh, could, could I ask please if you could, uh, through your indulgence, put out a, a doodle poll so that we can at least give some times that we're available because it, it might be just impossible. I mean, the certain times next week I just cannot make already. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, if if um, Patrick can make a note to send out to the members of the committee a, a doodle poll and we can get a... Chair, um, just, to, just to clarify something, given that four and five are very important, I wonder um, procedurally, do we need to have a, um, a, a proper vote or is, it, is affirmation okay? I just wanted to just check, given the background. 
Chairman, I'm okay with the vote. It's not a problem. But I'm, I think we'd all agree you would sit around this table with the vote. I mean, if, if to make it clear, oh, we've got uh, Rory. If we've got Rory can clarify. Is affirmation acceptable or would the individual vote be preferable? Um, Chair, thank you. Through you, I would be happy enough with, with affirmation, affirmation if that's agreed within the room, but obviously it's, um, it's ultimately a matter for members. Agreed, Chairman. I'm perfect with affirmation. Just wanted to check. That's all. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no contrary views, I think, by affirmation. We, we agree to the, to the, the deferment and we will, as I said, agree, agree and get back with a date at the earliest opportunity, but suffice it that in, individual members of the committee may have other things that in their calendars for next week. Okay. So we go to agenda item six, the internal audit update. <clears throat> so if I can invite Jonathan Tully, the head of internal audit to present his report. Good morning and uh, thank you, Chairman. Good morning to everyone. Um, so we're on page five of our agenda back, uh, packs. Um, the purpose of this document is just to provide an update to the committee on any recent key audit and governance uh, themes and developments. Um, so in this update, we highlight a couple of uh, developments regarding the procurement of local audits. Um, we also provide an update on assurance work. And I think as expected at the moment, the focus continues to be on business grants. Um, and we also highlight on our forward plan the energy rebate scheme um, and uh, to try and give the committee assurance that we're looking into that as well. Um, a point of interest this time is that we also have some external assurance um, from the DVLA that we process their data appropriately and safely. So we will use that as assurance for our annual governance statement later in the year. Um, we reflect on a press release that was issued regarding a successful prosecution. And continuing on the fraud theme, we actually have some quarterly fraud statistics at the end of the report as well. Um, that's all that I was going to say to introduce the report. I'm happy to take any comments or questions. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, I wonder if just for pure interest for sake, you could expand it to a bit more on page 13, please. So, just for pure interest, so we have an understanding of what's actually been happening. So, okay. Um, so, page 13 of the report is regarding uh, investigations in process. These statistics are provided by the fraud team. So, I wonder if we want to bring in Tara at this point, if Tara's on the call. Good morning. Yes, um, I am on the call. <laughs> So what, is, what would you like to discuss? Um, just a flavour of the type of things that you've been investigating and um, what has gone to court, etc. Just to, not too specific because I don't want to identify individuals, but just an understanding for the committee where you actually are, what you're actually doing. Sure, OK. So a, a common theme at the moment is um, around the reliefs and grant fraud. We recently uh, took the decision to take a case um, where we'd investigated uh, an owner of a business who had falsely claimed £10,000 from the Small Business Rates Relief um, grant fund. Um, so investigation took place and we successfully prosecuted them in court last week. Um, so that was quite an important case for us just because it is quite um, uh, a topical conversation at the moment, obviously, and we do have uh, a lot of new rebates, etc., on the horizon. So as part of our preventative activity, um, taking action there, we felt was um, necessary. Uh, the other work that we are doing at the moment is around the protecting um, our housing assets. So we're investigating social housing fraud as well. Um, and that's quite a high priority for the authority just because the the losses that can be attached to having to rehome 
uh, a family who is um, homeless or deemed homeless. And we've had um, some really good investigation work around that recently, which has resulted in at least one tenancy being returned. And we do have another case that has been recommended for prosecution for around social housing fraud and are in discussions um, relating to a third case about whether we actually pursue um, legal action. Um, we've seen less council tax support fraud really at the moment. Um, just in it, at the moment, we've only got one investigator on a full time basis, so our, our resources are quite limited and we're having to focus on where we think we can make the most impact and around grant fraud and housing fraud is where our focus has been. Thank you, Chairman. It's very good to know. I think it's especially good to know that we are catching people who try to defraud not only us, but other people who are, could be worthy of that grant as well. So that's excellent. And I do hope, in whatever the law allows, we can actually publicise that so people know we're here to give grants, but at the same time, if any fraudly tries to go for them, then obviously then we, can, um, we will come down on them, and, and correctly so. So thank you. Thank you very much, Tara. Any further questions or comments from the committee? Okay, thanks to Jonathan and, and Tara for, for, for the report and their feedback. Uh, the committee is asked to, to note <coughs> this report. <coughs> if we go on to uh, agenda item seven, regulation of Investi investigatory powers act REPA, um, we seek the committee's approval of the current policy and note the council's use of the regulation of investigatory, investigatory powers act. May I ask Rory McKenna to present this item? Uh, thank you, Chair. So, RIPA regulates covert investigations by a number of bodies, including local authorities, and the Investigatory Powers Commissioner's Office is responsible for the inspection of public authorities with regards to compliance with RIPA. Now, the Council was the subject of a remote inspection in February 2021, and the report concluded that the information provided demonstrated a level of compliance that removes for the present, the requirement for a physical inspection. The inspector also commented that the policy was a well-written document and easy to read, and that there have been no changes to the legislation since the last revision of the policy by this committee in March 2021. Now, as members will be aware, a function of this committee is to receive quarterly updates on the Council's use of RIPA powers and to review the RIPA policy on an annual basis. Therefore, the purpose of this report is to seek the approval of committee members on the current policy wording, noting that there are no updates from when it was approved last year, and to confirm that RIPA powers have not been used since the committee last met. Chair, the recommendations are outlined at 3A and B of the report at page 17, and that is the end of my report. Thank you. Chairman, I think we should agree this report. Any, any further comments? No. So <clears throat> the recommendation is that uh, the Order and Corporate Governance Committee approve the Council's RIPA policy as at Appendix A and note that the Council has not used surveillance powers between January 2022 and February 2022. Agreed? Agreed. It's been agreed by the, by the, the committee. <clears throat> Thanks to Rory for his report. So we move on to agenda item eight, <clears throat> anti-theft, fraud, bribery and corruption policy. <clears throat> May I ask Tara not being king to present this item? Chair. Yes. yes. Oh. Sure. Go on, people. So if it's okay, Tara, I'll just introduce the item and then if you pick up any questions that would come up. Um, so this, um, this anti-fraud, bribery and corruption policy is an update on a policy that... Uh, was somewhat out of date, so we've had a thorough review of that policy, um, and there's um, some additional information in there. The policy itself is looking at uh, how we deal with such things across the authority, so it's more of an inward-looking document and applies to both officers and members. So um, we brought the policy up to date, uh, just to, um, uh, and there's a number of changes to it. So um, I think it was well overdue on today, and I, I recommend this. 
policy to the committee. Any further questions from the committee? Councillor Williams? Um, can I just add that thank Tara for an excellent uh, uh, document and policy and uh, clearly um, you know, since um, setting up the corporate full team in 2020, um, I think that's from the previous um, uh, agenda item, it's shown to be the, to have been the right thing to do. And that this obviously is part of that uh, important work that they are doing uh, that we have an up-to-date policy. So I, I do thank her for the work that she's doing. Thank you. Uh, that Tara mentioned earlier that there the, the, the vacancies in, in this team. Yeah, so um, we've got one full-time investigator. We have got another investigator on board, but there's, there's quite a lot of training involved in, in bringing someone up to speed. So we have got two investigators, one who's going through a, an apprenticeship, um, and we've also got another officer who's an intelligence officer, and um, they do more of the preliminary work rather than the investigatory work. Um, I think we need to look carefully at the resources in the team because there is a lot of work there, and there's somewhat of a backlog. So it would be my intention to, to find some resources to get a further resource in to try and clear that backlog because the backlog obviously it's partly related to COVID because we weren't able to investigate uh, cases at that point. So I think it's quite important that we do get in a temporary resource at the very least to try and clear some of this backlog. So that would be the intention over the next few months to get that sorted out. Councillor Hales. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is uh, to Peter, if I may. Uh, are there any <clears throat> Excuse me, you say about um, getting somebody else in to help uh, deal with the backlog. Is there any limitation on time for investigating uh, fraud and what have you? Um, there is, Tara may know better than me on some of the limitations. Um, Hi. Okay, so. Obviously, we try to avoid any kind of uh, unreasonable delays when we are looking um, at investigating fraud. It does depend as well on some of the time bars and when we've got sufficient evidence to actually take a case forward. Um, it may be that we could argue in line with the delays that we've experienced because of COVID, because of the backlogs that and problems that we even the court system had at the time, that we can take the investigation to the point of interview and the interview being uh, the last piece of evidence. And then depending upon um, which act we're actually using to take it forward, we can look at the, the, the time bar that's on there. So what I would say is I think we still we are doing some triage work at the moment to look at cases. So to prioritise those cases where we've actually experienced a loss rather than an attempt, um, just so that we can reduce it. Um, but also, I do think that we, given everything that's happened over the last couple of years, um, I think that if we take it from the interview stage, we can still look at some of those cases where we think that there is merit and that the loss is quite high. Um, so if you, if, for example, when we've got sufficient evidence um, in terms of if we were using a fraud act offence, we've got up to 12 months time bar. The others are, can be a bit um, more limited around council tax support, um, but it's from when we've got sufficient evidence really. And up until the point where we've concluded the interview um, or concluded the investigation and invited the person in um, to make comments, I would argue that we could still investigate those cases where we thought there was merit. That, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that's, um, that's very clear. Thank you very much. I was just kind of linking in with Councillor Howell's, Howell's uh, point about where we we, we, we give confidence to the ratepayer that we're doing the right thing and what have you. We're not getting caught out by time, that's all. So uh, I fully support your, 
intentions, Peter, for extra staff, if you like, to do what you've got to do. Thank you. Councillor Howells. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and just say, coming back to what Councillor Hales just said there, I think it, it should be, um, what we do should also be a deterrent. And the only way it can be a deterrent is for other people to know by publicising these actual, what, what we actually do and the good work that's being done here. So I, I do strongly believe how you publicise it, that's a different ballgame, and I'll leave other people to get. But I do think we should be publicising the work that we're doing here and, and the uh, people that we successfully uh, take to court. And those people who we, for whatever reason, maybe cost or whatever reason, we come to an understanding with, you know, that should be highlighted that we do actually t follow this and we do look after our taxpayers and the, and the wider public. Thank you. Just a, just a, a quick question. It's, it's uh, on, I mean, this is fraud and theft and bri bri bribing corruption, but um, how does this cross refer to uh, uh, any sort of whistleblowing policy? Because I, I would assume that whistleblowing could be quite a, an important source of initial investigation, uh, but I, I, can't, I can't see that there's a cross reference to a, a whistleblowing policy or that you know, people who do whistleblow won't be held accountable if, 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 if perhaps their information is incorrect. I can answer that. Um, we do have a separate whistleblowing policy. Um, we've got the annexes where we've we refer to um, which this should be read in line with and whistleblowing is on there. I'm just having a conversation um, with HR um, at the moment just because we think that we may need to just look and review um, that policy, but there should be, it is referred to in the annex at C for 1.4, um, just to say that there is uh, a whistleblowing policy. And I think we touch on it later on as well, because we did have a discussion uh, with stakeholders around this about how we protect um, people that actually come forward. Um, and so it is something that was taken into consideration. Uh, I think it's under section seven in the report. Bear with me, let me just go through it. OK, so it's under raising concerns in the report. So it's 7.1 um, that we do encourage colleagues to raise any concerns that we have about issues or suspicions of fraud. Uh, and they can do that either through their line manager or any of the people that are detailed in the report. They can also do it via the whistleblowing policy um, and they can contact myself directly um, if they see that that's appropriate to do so. I mean, do, do we, and again, this, this is coming come from my background, do, do, do we um, identify, which I can is the wrong word, measure the, the number of whistleblowing events and, and, and should that be brought to this audit committee uh, along with the fraud as well. Um, as we were just saying, we, we are intending to review the whistleblowing policy and bring it back to the next committee. Um, I'm not entirely sure what it says in the whistleblowing policy on that. Maybe Rory might know better than me or, or, or Jonathan, but certainly um, as a result of um, putting together this policy, it's been recognised that the whistleblowing policy is in need of a review and that we were intending to do that over the next few months and bring it back in July. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to speak on that. Um, it's an interesting question um, about um, measuring the volume of whistleblowing cases. I think it's an interesting thing to report, but you do have to bear in mind that it's not always a easy thing to reflect about whether the whistleblowing policy is working well based on the volume of referrals. Um, so it's something that we could definitely bring back.
Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. It's I hadn't spotted. Seven point seven says a copy of the whistleblowing policy, so I, it, it's cross referenced. I, I, but yeah, I think it, it should be something that is when discussing fraud is identified, just just that we can identify and, and this this committee has vis visibility of whether there are whistleblowing events occurring or not. Because if, if there aren't, that's fine. But if, if there are, then that could highlight other issues that, that we, we need to be cog, cog, cognizant of and aware for perhaps changes in, in, in approach. Okay, and that's, that's, that's the only question I have. Is there any, any questions for anybody else? No? <clears throat> so uh, thanks, Tara, uh, for, for your report. And, and the committee is asked to approve the, the corporate fraud policy. Agreed? Okay. So that's been agreed. Moving on to agenda item nine, matters of topical interest, which is an opportunity for officers, auditors, and members, members to raise matters of topical interest. <clears throat> Does anyone have any matters that they wish to raise? Councillor Howells. Chairman, does, with regards to the um, decision not to use gas from Russia, does that have any impact with us commercially at all? Not only personally with regards to our building, but also any of the, um, what are the investments we've made. Sorry, I'll say it again, sorry. Well, I, no, no, that's fine. That's, that's fine, that's fine. With regards to the decision of the British government not to use Brit, um, Russian gas, does that have any effect on us personally with regards to this building or any other building, but also with regards to our investments? I think we need to, 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 as far as I'm aware, none of our investments uh, are with, you know, uh, involved in Russian gas. But I would need to double check that just to be absolutely certain. Um, a lot of our investments are, are with banks and building societies. Obviously, we've got a lot with Ernest Street, but we do have some invested in um, sort of in um, what do we call it? Um, Non-fossil fuel type. Bonds, uh, green, green bonds, and green investments. So let, let me double check that and come back to you just to make sure. Chairman, I, I have no problems with that whatsoever. But I do ask if that could be made sure that on the next time we meet, that is on the agenda. And uh, if if we do have any of those investments, maybe that should be highlighted so we can have a discussion about it. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, Chair. Um, I, I probably should have raised this earlier. Um, I, I just had a, a, a question occur to me um, after we closed the items. I suppose it relates to both seven and eight. And I just wondered how, um, for example, the item on Reaper and the following item on anti-theft, fraud and bribery, how does that sort of intersect with the shared services? You know, is there a sort of clarity of jurisdiction there or is, is there something we could comment on? In other words, um, who is responsible for the, the integrity of the shared services? Is that, is that a sensible question to ask? Well, certainly Rory would be able to answer in relation to Ripper because obviously he works for the shared service anyway. Yes. Uh, as regards the anti fraud policy, that policy relates just to us and, all, and that yes. isn't a shared service. So uh, I couldn't particularly comment on what's happening at the city or Hunts in relation to that. Okay. Thank you. Chair, sure. if you're happy, I will uh, take that question in relation to uh, Ripa. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, if members actually turn to page 48 of the report documentation, at appendix one, you will see the list of authorising officers. Um, so the authorising officers um, who are listed there uh, are both employees of South Cam's District Council, as is the uh, senior responsible officer, who is Anne Ainsworth, who's also the chief operating officer. So um, they, they are all direct employees of, of South Cam's, therefore shared services doesn't come into it. In terms of the, the RIPA monitoring officer role, that is obviously fulfilled by myself, um, who is employed under a shared service arrangement, but 
certainly there's no conflicts or issues that have arisen um, in the time that I have been fulfilling that function since I've been um, with the council since 2016. But obviously it's something that we would keep a keep an eye out on. But uh, hopefully that answers the question. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. OK, if there are no further comments, um, we'll go to the date of the next meeting. <clears throat> now, the next scheduled meeting is to be held on the 30th, 28th of July. However, we, as discussed earlier, we do need to schedule an extra meeting next week or at the earliest possible time to receive the 2018-19 accounts. And I understand that Janet Dawson can make the dates of the 6th and the 7th, but it is remiss of the, uh, the committee members to ensure that, that, that they can make those times. So as discussed earlier, we'll send out a doodle poll and get uh, a view of, of the committee members. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the, the 7th seems like it could be a possible date, but Let's, let's send a, a doodle poll, get, get an agreement, and then we'll get something in the, in the diary with EY and, and Janet to, to present the 2018 uh, accounts. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. I'll, I'll conclude the meeting today. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chairman.